Good morning and welcome to a chilly Juma private game reserve. And you can probably hear some sticks breaking next to me. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have Dangerous Dave on camera. And we have a large elephant that we can barely make out in the darkness just to the left of us. On the other vehicle is Jamie and Viam. And a welcome back to Kirsten. He's back from leave in final control with Louise and Rebecca. I think there's a full house there today. Here you can just see her tusks through the light on the edge of the vehicle. Munching away quite happily. You can actually hear her mask masticating. There we go. So a big thank you to all the updates about Tingana, who was on the Juma Dam Cam last night. Happened to be that Jamie and I were reading when we heard him calling, and I immediately switched on the Dam Cam. And actually, great work for the Zoomy who was on duty last night. We got such a wonderful view of Tingana. Uh, we are busy sitting on. Uh, a road which is in the sort of center of, Z of Juma at the moment on a road called Shabam at the junction with Philemon's cut line. Now the reason we're in this area, it is an area where Queen Karula, the dominant female leopard of Juma, has been seen frequently over the last few months and we did have tracks of her in this area yesterday. So we are hoping that she's going to make an appearance. I know Jamie is following Tingana's tracks at the moment and she, I'm sure she'll give you an update when we go back to her. But we're going to leave these elephants for the moment. And hopefully we'll catch up with them when it's a bit more light. And don't get a fright. We might get trumpeted at as we move past them slowly. Bye-bye, elephants. So while we keep looking for a female leopard, let's go see how Jamie's tracking of a male leopard is going. Good morning and welcome to a crisp and cold sunrise safari. If you are joining us for the first time, my name is Jamie and this morning I have Viam on camera with me. As you know, Viam is very, very fond of filming leopards. Not that all of our cameramen aren't, of course. Uh, we are trying our best to help him find one. And those of you who sent through the updates about Tingana last night at the Juma Pan, thank you very, very much. The nice thing about tracking Tingana after he leaves the Juma Pan in that direction is he kind of goes one of two ways. He either goes up where Tiller main access towards the gate, or, as he has done today, he comes along Zoe's Road and starts heading towards Arethusa. I do know that you have, or some of you have reported hearing sawing on the Arethusa Dam camera. I suspect it's him, his tracks are going in exactly the right direction. Can't show you now, obviously it's a bit tricky in this sort of light when it's still cold and misty and dark and there's no sun to illuminate the tracks. But I've got them in my headlights and they're going straight towards Arethusa. What that means, unfortunately, as some of you are aware, we've had some technical problems recently. The gremlins have been launching a full-on assault on our technology between Wendy and the various towers and unfortunately the Arethusa tower is down. What that means is that I don't think that Wendy is going to get to Arethusa and have signal there. However, what I will do when it gets a little bit later is I will call the other guides on the radio and I'll see if I can't get an update as to where he is. If he's close enough, we'll take a chance and we'll see if we can't get there. It worked with Tundi the other day on Cheetah Plains. As long as we sat very, very still and didn't breathe too loudly. As you can imagine, there's all kinds of technological challenges involved in bringing you a live safari straight from the middle of the African bush. As you can see, there has been a, another change to my headgear this morning. I now have, I think this is my fourth different beanie that we're attempting. It, it is 
courtesy of Kirsty, who has returned back to work. And a very warm welcome to her. It's lovely to have her voice in my ear once again, directing the show. Um, it does have something of a ridiculous pom-pom on the top, Kirst. But I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> it sort of, it bobs every time I move my head. <laughs> and I feel like it might actually, at this point, have its own gravitational pull. I don't think you can wear it at a cat side. Oh. <laughs> Bim says he doesn't think I could wear it at a cat sighting. Some zebras in the dark. Unfortunately, too dark for us to see. They are moving off. It's just that little bit too early in the morning to get a good view of them. I'm not going to shine my spotlight on them. Can you imagine Tingana jumping onto the bonnet to play with the bobble on my head? That would be sufficiently terrifying. All right, well, if we find a cat, I shall have to remove Kirsty's hat. Oh, that was very Dr. Zeus. <laughs> Dina has said that the fuzzball on my hat shall keep the gremlins away. Well, I certainly hope that is the case, Dina. Perhaps it shall be our lucky charm on Wendy and Rusty, the two vehicles that we're using at present, and it'll keep those gremlins from jumping on the back. It certainly is sufficiently terrifying. It is, however, incredibly warm and cozy. Kirsty also bought me a microwavable hot water bottle, which, for which I am most grateful. It is, as usual, tucked up inside my jackets to try and stave off the winter's chill. Liam, have you got your hot water bottle? Yes. yes. Liam's also got a hot water bottle now. It means there's enough to go around for the crew on the back of the vehicles. All right. Tingana's veered off into this block, to the west of this block, which is his usual path. I have followed in him in here once before. Now, Tingana, for those of you who are new to the show, and unfortunately it has been a while since we last saw him, one month and two days by James Richards' reckoning since we last saw him on our live safaris. He's a big, dominant male leopard. He's got essentially just a head and shoulders. His neck is so thick it barely looks like it's there. The last time I followed him into this block, or the last two times I followed him into this block, I discovered some old artfark burrows, a network of old artfark burrows, and I discovered them through <laughs> my wheels disappearing out from under me and being quite stuck, quite considerably stuck, and in one case stuck for a good hour and 15 minutes before I managed to get the car out with the help of Eugene. An interesting lesson learned there about where you can drive in this particular block and where you can't. And of course, the kicker to that, to add insult to injury, is that I seem to have some kind of artfark repellent about me. For I have yet to see, despite growing up in South Africa, traveling through game reserves, working throughout different game reserves in the country, I have yet to see an artfark. Uh, I just find their old burrows and network of tunnels, not the animal itself. But you will all be around when that changes, and I'm certain it's going to change very soon, because as we head into winter, or as we head further into winter, I think we have, it's safe to say we have arrived at this point, as we head further into winter, the nocturnal animals are coming out earlier and they're going to bed later which means we've got a far better chance of seeing them. And why just in the last few weeks, honey badgers, wild cat, the pangolin that I'm slightly just a little bit jealous of. Kirsty, your hat, your hat is determined to push my earpiece out of my ear and fall off my head. <laughs> There we go. I think I've managed to sort that out. Our last night, before the Juma Dam camera turned on Tintangana having a drink on the eastern side of the dam, we were listening to the roar from our bedroom at Inga's, 
And Leopold would like to know, is there a way to tell the roar of a big cat or the gender of a big cat through its roar? The answer is yes, there is. The closer that animal, for me personally, I find that the closer the animal is, the easier it is to tell what the animal's gender is. And that's just because once they get further away, it gets harder to judge the depth of the roar, as well as the fact that you have to listen to the, the, the last little bits of the call at the end. I'm just going to tell Brent to hold on for one second. Stand by one. Something, oh, hold on. Something scared these in parlor. Sorry, Leopold. Stand by. Apparently Brent is wild dog tracks. There's something here. What? Now, Impala don't call. They don't alarm call it wild dogs. Where, guys? What you looking at? Somewhere here. What you alarm calling at? We're gonna, I'm going to do a drive-by on these Impala. Something scared them this way. Where are we? Leopold, I'm going to get back to your answer in one second. You're not, please don't tell me your alarm calling at that one silly Impala that's standing off to the side there. Let's just double check very carefully around here. I'm hoping they haven't got confused. There is one Impala U standing off separate to the group. But they're still alarm calling and they weren't looking this far up. There's nothing walking on the road. Yay! And guys, I've just heard a report that Brent has found wild dog tracks. So we might get to see them for the first time in a long time. They're currently denning or looking for a den site, which means that we've hardly got to see them, but there are dispersal packs running around. They're still alarm calling. There's hyena tracks in the road, so that's not what they're shouting at. They generally don't alarm call at hyena. Now they're all looking at me with a great sense of curiosity. I'm racing because we're very close to the Simbombili Arethusa boundary here. If an animal is walking along this way, we don't want them to disappear on us. Sorry Brent, where were those tracks heading? direction. Let's just go and sit here. We're on the main road boundary. Guinea fowl. <laughs> there is indeed something crossing the road. <laughs> A flock of very quiet guinea fowl. Oh, there. What's up there? Racing. Racing. Hyena. No, they're coming towards us. It's the wild dogs. Hyenas. Is it hyenas? I can't see. Yeah, hyenas. Oh, it's hyenas. Sorry, I got very excited there. Thought it was the wild dogs. Excuse me, guinea fowl. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Where are you guys going? What's up? What's happening in your lives? What's got you excited? They're racing in that direction back towards the alarm calls of the Impala. Oh, sorry everyone. Round we go. This is an interesting start to the morning. It's a bit too, it's getting a bit too light. Spotlight, Kirst, your hat's got to go, I'm sorry. Oh, what is happening with those hyena? Where are they racing to? Are they following the alarm calls of the Impala, which is entirely possible? What do they know that we don't? 
There's no tracks here apart from Impala, I mean, uh, hyena tracks that I can see. Oh my word, they're going so fast. And are the hyenas hunting Impala, which is entirely possible. <laughs> now that I've removed my hat, let's find out, Jacob, if the alarm calls are at my hat. What's up, Impala? Look, they're all looking. There, there look. What's happened there? What have they found? There's a wildebeest. Oh! Wildebeest coming to investigate. Tails up of the hyena. He came to see what those hyena were doing. And they were definitely following the alarm calls of the impala in the hope that they might score a free meal. That's why they were racing down the road. Hmm. I can hear an elephant. The impala were definitely not alarm calling at that. Let's go forward a bit, see if we can't see what they've got there. <laughs> Is this wildebeest going to attempt to chase the hyena? It's entirely possible. He's thinking about it. What an exciting start to our morning. Good morning. What are you up to? That looked like pretty in that brief glance that I had of her. Oh, and there comes the second. Now we've got the go away birds alarm calling. And that is not a normal go away bird call, that is an alarm call. but I think they're alarm calling at the hyena, which is unusual, but not impossible. All right, let's, get, let's try and follow them. Let's try and keep up with them. If there were a leopard still here, they would be showing us where it is. Another U-turn, everybody. Oh. bumpiest section of road at the whole of Juba <laughs> and we've got to fly across it. Don't go that way hyenas. We will definitely not be able to follow you. And just just have a look at the stride, okay? I mean, I'm in third gear. I'm probably cruising along at around 20, 25 kilometers per hour. And the speed that these hyenas are able to keep and maintain, oh, off the road we go, is phenomenal. This is a very, very thick block. I'm not going to be able to follow them in there. There's something here that has got them interested. I don't know what they're looking for. This is the block where I feel as though Karula's tracks disappeared into. Karula the leopard, the queen of Juma. Okay, another U-turn. <laughs> James Richard has said maybe we should think they're going back again. Oh my goodness. You're keeping me guessing, hyenas. I know you can't see them at the moment, but they're racing back to where we just had them. Oh, back again. Are they hunting the impala? It doesn't look like it. <laughs> so James Richard has suggested we add them to our tracking team. James, I'll ask them as soon as they stand still long enough for me to, to have a good conversation. Uh, 
and back once again on Tuchuma. <laughs> He's patrolling up and down the western boundary that is known as Triple M. Let's try and figure out exactly what's going on here. Now, strangely enough, here come the hyenas again. The impala, that's all of them. It's all right, guys, what's going on? What is going on? There's elephants, there's hyena, there's everything around here. Elephants right at the back of the clearing and hyena returning to the site of the where we started. I don't know where to look. I'm going to look at these hyena though because they've smelt some obviously something happened here. Let's go forward a little bit now that the wildebeest is out of our way. Hello. Hello ladies. <coughs> Excuse me. Looks like madam. Who have we got here? I did smell something earlier. I wonder if there... I don't know. I have no idea. There's another hyena. There's a third that's come to join the fray. What on earth is going on? There's something here. There is a third hyena, I promise. It's just decided not to come and join us. A bit of affection. <coughs> Please excuse me. All that racing has basically thrown dust up into my face and Vivian's as well. A little bit of affection there, in a way, but a very submissive affection. You can see that the hyena upon whom her attentions are being lavished is a little bit nervous of her attentions because one wrong move and it will go from gentle grooming to quite serious nipping. Where is that poor hyena gone? I promise you there was one. Oop! Ouch! Thorn! <laughs> a shame! Stepped on a thorn very clearly. Little yelp. Hmm. Well, your guess is as good as mine. It's something has clearly happened here. That something could be a couple of things. It could have been a leopard kill, a small leopard kill, that the leopard has since consumed most of whatever it was, or maybe a rival clan or an unknown clan, <coughs> unknown hyena came and either defecated or urinated here, or wild dogs came racing through. I can't see any tracks of them, but you never know. Could be almost anything. But something here has attracted their attention. Just to let you know, the alarm calling Impala have moved straight into the direction of where they were alarm calling. Uh, in other words, whatever's there hasn't terrified them too much, or at least not to the point that they are too stressed out about it. I'm just going to have a quick look at the two bulls that are walking across the open area. Two magnificent males. Stunning in this morning light. And I'm going to try and stick with our hyena for now. We've been spoilt with elephants recently. And we've been... We've actually had some really nice hyena sightings as well. And they are moving off. 
All right. I hope you're all keeping count of the number of U-turns I've just done in the last five minutes, ten minutes. Oh, no. Which way are we going? We're going into the block. Guys, please don't forget to send through your questions. Ooh, gone. Into the other side of the road. Please don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or, you turn again, email them through to questions at wildearth.tv. It's possible that those Impala were alarm calling at the third hyena that we never got a chance to get a glimpse of. It looked like one of the females, just judging by size, but it didn't come and approach the others. So it might have been a large male, maybe, that was just hanging about on the outskirts, not drawing attention to itself. have a look and maybe go back and investigate the area that they were sniffing. Let's see what Brent is up to now that he's made it to Cheetah Plains. So Dave and I are popsicles. We just rushed down towards the plains at the half chance, and I do iterate half chance at my favorite animal, the African wild dog. Their tracks heading towards the Cheetah Plains boundary. So we're just going very slowly, making sure we don't miss any tracks. And there's also tracks of a female leopard. So, so far, so good. After being on Cheetah Plains yesterday and the only thing alive was a secondary bird, uh, we're hoping that it's going to produce this morning. Now, you can never guarantee what's out here, or you can guarantee the animals out here, but you never guarantee whether you're gonna find them. And that is one of the exciting things about being on a live safari. You literally cannot predict. There's no script. You never know what's going to be around the next corner. And that is a wonderful thing. And if any of you are new and just stumbled upon us, hi, I'm Brent. I've got Dave as my cameraman. And we're in the northeastern part of South Africa uh, within the greater Kruger National Park, searching for Africa's amazing creatures in a very cold for us not so cold for a lot of our viewers but a very cold climate for us it's our dry season or winter about 11 degrees celsius uh, which is about 52 fahrenheit and i've got about five layers on blanket hot water bottle mittens and i'm still cold so when you see me lean over like this, I'm looking in the sand to try to see if there are any tracks of the animals we're looking for. And one of the best ways to find animals is to find their tracks and get a, a general idea of where they're going. We're going to keep checking really carefully around here. But while we do that, Jamie is back with Crocutta Crocutta. I'm, I'm back with the hyena, or desperately trying to at least. We, are, we appear to be going back where we were before. <laughs> Maybe I should just sit in one place <laughs> at this point. What's so wonderful about this sighting is that little show of affection that we saw earlier. They're actually playing with each other. So jumping up, playing a little bit like wild dogs do or puppies do. Okay, now where have we gone? Trying to keep up with them is almost as difficult as keeping up with wild dogs at full speed. Oh, 
especially on this very bumpy main road. And I think they just followed those alarm calls to that area and then found something that smelt nice. I don't know what it might have been. And I think that those Impala made a mistake. I think one was in alarm calling at another. That's an interesting theory from Bethany, a really good theory. Bethany has asked, do I think that there could be a hyena, could have been a hyena fight last night? Because last time that happened, Corky and Pretty returned to the scene. Corky and Pretty are two very high-ranking females within the hyena clan themselves. And they returned to the scene of the crime, so to speak, to have a good, jolly good sniff around. That is entirely Morning, possible, uh, entirely plausible. Very, very good theory, especially because we are right on the boundary. This clan, they're basically in their, on their very western, from what we can tell, obviously, we don't 100% know, but from what we can tell, we're right on their western boundary. And what do you have to say for yourself? What are you up to? That third hyena still hasn't shown itself. This is clearly the lighter colored hyena is a submissive one and pretty is clearly the more dominant which is how we understand our hyena dynamics anyway and Corey this is very very common to see them moving about in groups of two like this so yes whilst a hyena clan has an a, a big can be up to 40 50 even 70 members in certain parts of Africa they very seldom unite in one large group unless they are mobbing a lion pride to try and get them off a kill or faced with a territorial dispute from another clan. Oh, and we're going, where are we? Oh, we're going back again. <laughs> Keeping us guessing this morning. Maybe I should just drive in reverse because they never know when they're going to turn around and come back again. We're going back. Whoopsie. My foot is almost, well, we're almost going as fast as we can in reverse gear. And this is just a sloping run for the hyenas. They can do this all day. I'm not even going to try and reposition because they're just constantly moving. Corey, so groups of two or three, very, very common. And then particularly with the males, foraging on their own is also very common. I know this is exceptionally uncomfortable for you all, but it is interesting to see the speed of this hyena. They've moved. Oh, they're still going. It's incredible the stamina of these animals. Just racing through the bush. And they can do this for miles and miles at a time. They're coming back to the road. Oh, we're not even going to beat them there, which is what I was hoping to do. Let's turn around. I was hoping to try and get in front of them, but they're just too fast for me. Very, very valid point from Corey in Massachusetts. 
saying that it's quite hard to keep track of who is afraid of whom out here and why are the impala afraid of hyena why aren't they afraid of hyena and what is afraid of a hyena it's a tricky one it's a really difficult question to ask answer and i'll tell you why anal are we anal pasting or adding to latrine no just urinating there's marking territory Whew. and off back into juma and they've split us right between roads now so if they carry on going to, to the east it's going to be tricky to try and keep up with them Corey the reason I say that it's a tricky question to answer is because hyena hunt in certain areas and they don't hunt in others there we go the submissive hyena immediately urinating on top of where the more dominant one did that is an instinctive response. So the hyena in this area, from what we've seen, adding to. Sorry, Corey, I'm trying to concentrate on split, splitting my attention in two here. So adding to a, a latrine, in other words, defecating in the same spot, <laughs> and caught out now because Pretty hasn't decided to wait, so now this hyena has to catch up with her. And off we go again. So the interesting thing is, Corey, what we're watching here with them racing along like this, this is the incredible stamina of a hyena. They can do this all day. Not quite all day, but they can run for exceptionally long periods of time. So what they do is they can chase down, if they choose to, chase down and exhaust their prey. So rather than being ambush predators like a a lion or a hyena, oh, sorry, a lion or a leopard, I've lost them, they just exhaust their prey if they decide to hunt. But in this area, because the lions are so successful, from what we can tell, our clan actually don't do all that much hunting. Let's just stop here so I can try and work out where they're going to go. Now, our clan don't do all of that much hunting. They do a lot of scavenging, and the animals in this area are aware of that. But also the alarm calls from an impala are to draw attention to a lion or a leopard trying to sneak up on them. That's where that instinctive response comes from, to alert everyone and also to let the lion and the leopard know that they have been spotted. Because 99% of the time, if a lion or a leopard has been spotted, chances are they're just going to give up. They're not going to attempt to carry out that hunt because it's a waste of energy because they do not have stamina like hyena and wild dogs. They overheat, they are sh they're, they're predators that act over very, very short distances. That being said, I have seen the Nkumas chase for a very long time when they are desperate enough. So there's no point to an impala alarm calling it a hyena because if those hyenas are going to hunt them, it's going to be through constant wearing down. Now a large pack of hyenas that's clearly on the hunt might provoke one or two alarm calls before the, the impala start to scatter but otherwise they tend to not bother. It's not that they're not afraid of them and it's not that they're not going to run away if the hyenas start moving towards them. There's a different aspect to that as well. These hyena, I think that the, the, they were attracted to the, to the alarm calls but they're not displaying predatory behavior. Now if they'd started moving in a straight line with intent heads down towards those impala Impala would have reacted very, very differently. And bearing in mind that animal, the language that animals speak is through body language. So they're very, very adept at reading what an animal's intentions are. A stalking leopard is very different to a, a leopard walking past at 100 meters. I don't know where these hyenas have gone. They have gone in somewhere to the west of us, towards Arethusa. Very, very close to where I suspect their clan boundary to be. I was hoping they were going to come out into the road, but it appears that I am mistaken in that. Oh! In that sense. Morning! <coughs> Elephant cow. Is speaking of animals' body languages, you see how she ran across the road there. Tail up and straight and stiff 
and that tells us immediately she's unhappy about something. Probably hyenas racing around her ankles. She won't be terribly impressed with them. Even though a hyena is of absolutely no threat to an elephant, they don't take kindly, same, same with the wild dogs, they don't take kindly to predators racing around them. I think that might spell the end of our hyena sighting, but what an exciting way to start off our morning. I don't know where they've gone, but I'm sure that we can find, or we can try and find them once again. So while we do that, and we leave our Ellie cow in peace, just because she's not terribly impressed with life. Let's find out how things on Cheetah Plains are going. So I just got a call from Andrew and we've rushed back from where we were. And look at this, we've got some lions. So we came out here looking for wild dog and, and leopard. And we found some big Morning, thank you Andrew. Sticks. So it looks like the sticks pride. You can actually see suckle marks on that female's belly. And you can see around her nipples there, a little wet patch. Now, hopefully they've brought the cubs to visit cheetah plants. But they have got massive bellies. They've obviously been feeding quite well. There we go, you can see the suckle marks. Look at this, isn't this great? Now you can see the sun just trying to come onto this west facing slope and they've definitely eaten something if you look at the size of her belly. Sorry guys, I'm just trying to listen, I thought I heard something. can hear an Egyptian goose making noise in the distance. <laughs> so we found the tracks of these lionesses a couple of times around the western edges of Cheetah Plains and the southern boundary. And this is the first time I've seen these sticks ladies in a very long time. So they have been keeping their cubs further to the, the west of here, but there's always a chance. Always a chance that they could have brought the cubs into this creek system or river system that runs below the Cheetah Plains Lodge. This particular Styx lioness for me is one of the biggest lionesses we see around. She is a massive female. And I think these lions were spotted while everyone was having coffee or tea to start the morning at Cheetah Plains. Oh, look at that. And that beautiful light in her eyes. Now, wouldn't it be nice if they decided to do a bit of roaring? Oh, 
Look at that belly. Definitely had a good meal last night. And you can see the sun is starting to creep onto the lioness at the back there as it gets a little bit high on the horizon and it should catch up with us. And this cold weather, we quite like the sun and I think the big cats will as well. A bit of basking in the sunlight. So they've obviously fed very well last night. Now, the reason I say I think they might have spotted these lions from the Cheetah Plains Lodge is because if we have a look just over here, there's the little water, ooh, there's the little water hole in front of the lodge. I need Dave to zoom in. So there's the water hole. If we go slightly to the left, keep going, keep going. There we go. There's the lodge, and there's someone getting everything ready for when the guests get back from game drive later. So I think they were spoiled while having coffee this morning. There's two lioness walk down to the pan for a drink. And for those of you who might be new, the Styx Pride is sort of the pride we see the second most of, or traditionally did, till sort of the lion dynamics have shifted heavily in this area. And when the Birminghams first took over, uh, they had quite a, I think it was, they had two little cubs, which the male lions killed. So it's a strong possibility that their current sets of cubs are from the Birmingham boys. Now they, are, they have eight cubs between the three lionesses. We've only got two of the lionesses here. The other might be with her cubs. So Jen B says it looks like she might have caught mange from her mating partner. There's a Birmingham boy who has a bit of bare skin on his belly. If we go closer into that, please, Dave. A little bit closer. Uh, Jen, I don't think it's mange. And I think it's probably just a little fungal infection. And I don't think that Birmingham boy has got mange either. So because his hair has started growing back and that would be very uncommon if it was sarcoptic mange. And as you can see, oh, Dave, quick. Look at that. Just this very beautiful grey heron flying in that morning light for the birders. We've got big cats and birds. Oh, he goes. So isn't this exciting? We are going to sit here for a while, but if they don't move in the next 10 minutes, I think with the belly that size, it's unlikely. But what we can do, we'll probably sit for 10, 15 minutes just to see if they move. Maybe the cubs are around. If they don't move, we'll head off. We've got male leopard tracks that we found and we were following when we got called for these lines. And there's also still the chance of wild dogs. So if they're not going to move, we'll leave them be and come back a little later on the safari. But for now, let's just sit and see if they move. Just zoom there on her back for me, please, Dave. What is that? Ah, oh, just a little bite mark. Probably from fighting over food. So, speaking of lion's food, Joey in Australia would like to know, do lions ever hunt kudu? And uh, if so, how often? Well, they do hunt kudu if that's what they happen to come across. But lions are opportunistic hunters, so they'll hunt what's in front of them. In this area, they tend to hunt quite a lot of buffalo, especially now moving into the, the drier months. So the buffalo are dropping a bit of condition. The herds actually forming, they're forming bigger herds, up to about 500 at the moment. So there's always a chance of grabbing a baby or a weaker one out of those big herds. So at the moment, they tend to be focusing on buffalo. But if a kudu happened to walk in front of them, they definitely wouldn't say no. And uh, 
I'd say in certain parts of Africa, kudu form quite a big part of lion's diets. Now, one must remember that a lot of this stuff, rather than being animal specific, is area specific. So the lions here will behave slightly differently to the lions in the Okavango or the South Wangwa. I mean, there's a lot of general traits that are the same, but when it all depends on the surrounding bush and the surrounding densities of game. So where there's a lot of buffalo, lions tend to focus on buffalo. Where there's not a lot of buffalo, lions tend to focus on the other big animals. So, for example, in the Kalahari Desert, the lions do hunt a lot of kudu, as well as eland and chemspork. Uh, but out here, I'd say, well, they, I have seen the one kudu kills before, but I'd say buffalo is the main animal they focus on here. I'm just going to move the vehicle quickly. And if you're wondering and want to know more about these lions, just pop me an email, questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try get that lioness who's lying in that gorgeous morning light. Oh, she's not so full. So it looks like maybe the other one was a greedy gut or caught something small while she was away from the other lioness. And she's hungry, but by no means starving. But just look at that wonderful early morning light on her. Oh, she looks like she's just moving out of the early morning light. Oh, just zoom in on her nipples as well. And, yeah, suckle marks there as well. So you see... When I'm referring to suckle marks, you can see the nipples are in, enlarged, but there's that damp patch around them, and that can last for quite a while. Um, so it looks like she's what the other lioness that's got cubs. If I remember correctly, they got four each. I'm just going to move again to get the light on the female lion opposite us. How's that, Dave? Beautiful. Oh, there's one little blade of grass that I think is going to irritate me. Let me. Just go forward a little bit. There we go. So, a very good morning to Bud in North Carolina. Bud would like to know how long would a female lion stay away from her cubs? A completely dependent, but often as long as three or four days, but generally around as short a time as possible depending on food availability and stuff but they will often I'd say two days is sort of the norm and they will try to get back sort of every two days but they can leave them for much longer periods oh so comfy Now, nothing looks quite as comfortable as a lion sleeping, and they do a lot of it. On average, a lion will sleep for about 20 hours a day, and the four hours of movement is not four hours of movement constantly. And quite often, walk 20 minutes, lie down half an hour, walk half an hour, lie down an hour. So it all depends on how hungry uh, they are or what they're up to. Uh, lionesses will also defend a territory against other lionesses, even lionesses that might fall within the same, under the same coalition of males. So the Styx Pride and the Inkuma Pride both fall under the Birmingham Boys. That was a coalition of five males. And about a month ago, one of the males died from internal injuries from a buffalo, we think. And there we go. Sorry. Just turn on the game drive radio for a second. Lots of chitter chatter. And so if the Nkuma Pride and the Styx Pride had to meet, there would probably be a fight. The Nkuma have the numerical advantage at the moment. So they tend to avoid each other.
can hear the dawn chorus of birds has suddenly decided to wake up. The Franklins are giving it a proper go. You can hear starlings, orioles, red-billed buffalo weavers. Egyptian geese. Oh, good morning, Natasha in Ontario. Uh, no, I shouldn't complain about cold because you guys get bitterly cold up there in the Great White North. But Natasha is wondering, do lion cubs have a better survival rate than leopard cubs? They don't. It's, it's, it's very similar, around 70, 70 to 75 percent of the cubs will die and again like leopards most of them are killed by male lions so male leopards kill leopard cubs and male lions kill lion cubs now a lot of that is done by nomadic lions so young males that are still too young to find their own territory and move through different areas now like all little cubs out here they have quite a strong chance of also being killed by hyenas, by leopard, by cheetah, lion cubs. I've actually, I've seen lion cubs killed by buffalo. A herd of buffalo smelted them out and stampeded over them. And a lot of that also depends on the strength of the pride. Now, believe it or not, I've been watching this. Well, the first time I saw the sticks pride must have been 10 years ago. Uh, further south, their territory does extend south from the northern Sabi Sands into the central Sabi Sands. And when I first used to see the Styx Pride, there were 11 adult females in it. So they were a very big pride. And now I think there are only three, hey Andrew? Three. Yeah. So, and that happens often with uh, lion prides and they, they go through dips and, 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 and peaks. But it's, it's a very fascinating thing. Now, we chat a lot about how female leopards invest more time in the male cubs because it's the best chance of them spreading their genes because the male is going to move out and mate with multiple females that are generally not related to them. But with lions it's slightly different. So the, the genetic strength of the lion pride is within the females. So they defend the female cubs probably a bit more vigorously than the males. Male cubs also bring danger as soon as they start getting over about two and a half years old, um, even from their own fathers or from outside males. So a male lion is not something you want to have in your pride for too long. But with females, the genetic strength lies within the females. So they do protect those female cubs a bit better than the male cubs. And difficult to say if they put more effort into it, but there's a at a certain stage when they start trying to push the males out of the pride. Now that doesn't always happen, we've seen that with the Inkawumas. They seem incredibly tolerant of, of, of junior, but that is a, not the norm. Sandy's wondering, do lions have more female cubs than male cubs? Sandy, it's, it's a lottery, just like with the leopards, you never know. And I'm not sure what the sexual makeup of the Styx cubs are yet. There are eight of them, and there's bound to be both male and female in a group of cubs that large. Now, the other interesting thing about lions is that they are aloe sucklers. Now, that's a very strange sounding word, aloe sucklers. What could an aloe suckler be? So they're co cooperative sucklers. So because that genetic strength lies within the strength of the pride, the females will suckle, excuse you, Dave, um, will suckle cubs that are not theirs. Of course, they're probably going to share a lot of genetics with those cubs. So lion cubs will suckle from all the different females that happen to be lactating at that time. And this is very interesting in cats. And lions are the only truly social cat. And, and that is, that's why they have some behaviors that are very different from the rest of the felid family.
morning, Tammy. Tammy would like to know, do lionesses, when they have cubs, keep their dens away from each other or close together or whatnot? They'll generally be apart until they introduce those cubs to the pride. Now, the sticks seem to introduce the cubs to the pride quite early in comparison to other lions I've seen in other parts of Africa. Now, as I said, the animal behavior is area specific and even be pride specific uh, rather than species specific. So, last time they introduced cubs at around a month and a half, which is very young, normally, oh, it can be as young as a month, but normally closer to two months when the, the cubs are introduced to the pride. Now, the reason, the main reason for this is because lions forget that they're friends when it comes to dinner time and they tend to box each other quite fiercely around the carcass and when those cubs are quite young they could accidentally get a swat from a paw uh, that, that could injure them heavily or even kill them and that's one of the reasons the cubs are kept away from the main body of the pride for for quite a while So it doesn't look like these girls are going to be moving anytime soon. So I think we're going to carry on, see if we can get back onto those male leopard tracks and even maybe the wild dog tracks. So we're going to leave these ladies to sleep up. We'll definitely come back and check on them a little later. Bye bye ladies. I mean not even a head raised as we move out of here. So we're in the far east of our traverse area on the beautiful Cheetah Plains private game reserve and we're going to now fly back to the northwest to see what Jamie's up to on Juma. As far west as you can get actually on Juma. We're still around where the hyena have been snuffling about and I've just heard on the radio that they are tracking Tingana on Simbambili. So that's where he has gone. He has indeed crossed and he's actually crossed out of Arethusa as well. So they're looking for him around there. We've got the last of the Ellie bulls that tried to cross, uh, that crossed through in the clearing when we first started off our sunrise safari. He's a wonderful, gentle boy. He came right up close to the vehicle, gave us a little bit of a head shake and then moved off. And we've just been dealing with some other things that we've needed to do, which is why we have not been on your screen for the time being. We've just been sorting out a couple of different things that we can't do whilst presenting live. There's something I wanted to address, actually, because I didn't answer the question properly, or at least I didn't finish answering the question. See, at least doesn't want to stay in my ear this morning. And that was a question that came from Corey about what animals are afraid of hyenas, why don't an impala alarm call, and so on. And Corey, I apologize, because it was just, it was, it was in the middle of that higher action moment. We spoke about predatory body language, but you wanted to know what types of animals are afraid of hyena, and I don't think we ever fully addressed that. So we kind of covered why they weren't alarm calling necessarily the hyena, but not what animals would be under threat. And Pala, yes, although they are quite speedy, and it's, it's not all that often that hyena will target hyena, um, will target impala unless it is right at the beginning of their birthing season. So when they're giving birth to their new lambs, they are exceptionally vulnerable, and hyena do. Hyena, jackal, leopard, lion, every predator sort of starts to target hyena around that. Impala, what is wrong with me? Oh, I'm sorry, I can't get the names of the animals right. That is a slight problem for a guide. The one animal that hyena do hunt, there's two, actually there's two, animals that are of the right size and that's baby zebra and baby wildebeest which is why that wildebeest's instinctive response was first of all to go and have a look to see if it could chase them away and then it ran away when the hyena showed interest in its approach. And they do hunt baby zebra quite regularly as well as baby wildebeest if they can. And the adults are not defenseless
but they are not able to chase away a big group of hyena. And that's, it, it won't be in that scenario where we have maybe one or two hyena running about together. It will be in the situation where you have several all grouped together trying to hunt something. So those are the sorts of animals that would be afraid of a hyena. A steenbok or a daker doesn't really have anything to worry about unless if they go barreling into right into a sleeping hyena by mistake. Unfortunately, our elephant has very much moved out of the view that we had. I'm going to try and roll back just to get you a slightly better view. He's been very busy pushing over trees and digging at whatever else he can find. He's now attached himself to the branch of a bush willow. <laughs> Looks like he's trying to decide whether he wants to snap it or not. And pressing down on it with his foot. If he really wanted to get it, or snap it completely, he could with just a slight downward pressure from that front foot but I think he just wants to hold it there so that he can pluck off the various leaves. So not interested in totally destroying that branch. It's amazing watching the coordination of an elephant as they feed. The different ways in which they use their feet, their tusks, their trunks and their mouths all combined to get the most effective way of taking food and putting it into their mouths. And they do, I mean, they, they've got plenty of practice at it since an elephant, in order to maintain its enormous body weight, has to eat pretty much constantly to survive. Very short napping periods, resting periods, and periods spent drinking. But the majority of their day and night is spent munching away. It's the price they pay, first of all, for being between around three to six tons in weight, and then also for having a very ineffective digestive system. And then defecate out about a third to a half of what they have eaten. It's also a hindgut fermentation process. It's quite a lot faster than that of a ruminant's digestive process. It goes through faster, a lot more is wasted, but it goes through very quickly. I think we're going to leave our Ellie. We still have a couple of things we need to do whilst in this morning light. We're just filming some behind the scenes clips and we need to make the most of this beautiful morning light out here on Impala Plains. Now while we do that, I'm going to send you back across to Brent on Cheetah Plains. So, we're now checking those leopard tracks cut east into the block here. So I'm just checking this little two tracks, see if we can find any tracks of that male leopard. It could be two different male leopards in this area. Quarantine has been hanging about this part of the world, uh, as well as a leopard I haven't seen before, uh, called Shavambalan, who's one of Karula's other offspring. So if anyone's new, Karula is the dominant female leopard we see on Juma. Uh, we're quite far from Juma now, so what happens with young male leopards, and both the young male leopards in this area are her offspring, uh, they disperse away from their natal territory, and that's to try and make sure they don't mate with their mother or uh, with one of their half-sisters, possibly. Now, it does happen, and inbreeding in, in, in big cats is not nearly as big a problem as it is in other animals. Lions, for example, can inbreed for up to six generations without there being any adverse effects. Uh, leopards, probably about the same. But I think quarantine, he's about four, just over four years old now. Better be careful because if Shavamba Lion, his half brother, gets hold of him, he'll give him a good hiding. He's about six. And he's definitely, it looks like he's setting up uh, to be the dominant male uh, on the eastern parts of. Uh, cheetah plains. Now Tangana does come into the western parts. He hasn't been down here for a while 
So it'll be very interesting to see uh, if Shivamba line keeps moving a bit further to the west. Now, the problem with that is the next female over, uh, which hangs around the Cheetah Plains Lodge, is a female called Tandi, who would be one of his half-sisters. And she's from Karula's first litter. But as I said, inbreeding, not the worst thing in big cats. Okay, so we're gonna go have a quick squiz past the three in a row pan. It is dry at the moment, but those tracks were heading in that direction generally. Oh, hello mister. Oh, off you go at high speed all by yourself. All right, mm, a single impala. Not snorting at anything, so we're going to leave him be. Okay, let's just try it. Turn the volume up on my radio. And Joey in Australia is requesting a big male kudu today. Well, Joey, I think we're going to have to ask Jamie for that. She's got a better chance on Juma. We don't see as many kudu uh, on Cheetah Plains. I think what we can hopefully expect on Cheetah Plains is some wildebeest, maybe some zebra. But there's always a chance we might find a big male kudu here. So today, 90 years ago, the Kruger National Park was formed. Now, a few of you might be a bit confused saying, but no, it's 120 years old, it's not 90 years old. So what happened was, initially, there were two different reserves. There was the Shingwedzi Reserve in the north and the Sabi Reserve in the south. And there was this large, massive land in the middle that was privately owned and privately owned by one family, the Open family. And if you've ever been to Kruger, you drive through a gate called Open Gate. And that massive land between the Sabi River and the Shingwedzi River was donated to the Kruger by Eileen Open, uh, the matriarch of the Open family. And also quite a few, uh, quite a lot of the timber vitae was also originally owned by the Open family. And that's also under wildlife now. So a uh, really great lady in terms of far seeing conservation value. But what's the most amazing thing is how much Kruger has changed. Now, when the Kruger was first formed, the warden, Stevelson Hamilton, and the rangers used to shoot lion, leopard, cheetah, wild dog, brown hyena and spotted hyena and jackal, caracal, serval, basically any predator that you'd shoot on sight. Now the theory behind this is that they were protecting the impala and the zebra and the... and, <laughs> and it's amazing how conservation has changed. I mean in 90 years it's not that long a time uh, to now Kruger having some of the biggest populations of those predators left in Africa. A truly amazing story. Now as we've learned, uh, the management of these wild areas has changed extensively over the years and uh, to now where it's mostly a hands-off to a degree. So we always like to be, as uh, my dad says, gardeners in Eden. We take an absolutely perfect thing and then we start fiddling with it. But fortunately that doesn't happen too much anymore. So no sign of these leopard tracks so far, but there have been a few herds of elephants that might have obliterated tracks. And the only two bits of water on Cheetah Plains at the moment is that pan near where the lions were lying and Cheetah Plains pan towards the open areas. So we're going to take a meander towards Cheetah Plains pan and see if we get any success in that area.
So the wonderful thing about having a diverse traverse, a traverse area is we're able to, to focus uh, our attentions in different areas. So Jamie's in the, in the west and north on Juma, which is undulating mixed broadleafed woodland. And here on Cheetah Plains, we are in undulating mixed broadleaf woodland at the moment, but it's slightly different. The trees aren't as big. The soil's quite a lot more sandy, so we do get a few different tree species around here that we don't see as commonly on, on Juma. But also, as we keep moving further east onto the sodic soils around uh, the Kruger boundary, we get those wonderful big open plains that do enable us to see different species sometimes of bird as w and as well as mammal. So we definitely see cheetah more often down here, although we haven't had much cheetah luck for the last while. Sorry, let's have another look at this track I saw here. Where did it go? There it is. Um, it's very difficult to show you because it's been walked over by zebra. Uh, so I'm not going to show you, but it is a female leopard track. Now, in Kanyin has already been found to the north of us. So this could be a different female coming in from the south. So I'm just looking down at the ground, so you'll have to forgive me for a few seconds while I try to figure out exactly what's going on here. So there's zebra tracks over them. The zebra tracks look quite fresh. But uh, the leopard track, so maybe early last night, because I did drive here yesterday, and these tracks are on top of my tracks. So there's always a possibility of seeing a new animal. And that's the joy of being part of the Greater Kruger National Park. And even on a larger scale, but what's it now? This is, this is a bit of a mouthful. The Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. So it's about 13 million acres and it encompasses three countries, South Africa, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe. And so the animals are able to move freely through this whole area and you never know what's gonna happen. Now, when you're a bit further in the reserve, you still never know what's gonna happen. You can always see a new creature that you haven't seen before, but it tends to be more common here in the eastern sections because we're right on the border of the Kruger and that border of the Kruger inside there is a wilderness area so there's very few roads and it is pretty much left to be alone so there's always a chance of new lions or new leopards coming in from that area. Seems to be having some volume issues today, but anyway, let's do okay. So Aaron in New Zealand is wondering what's my favorite memory of Kruger. I've got quite a few. Um, recently, Jamie, uh, myself, and, and some friends of mine, we spent quite a few days in Kruger, and I think we saw six leopards in two days, which were really great, and some really beautiful sightings. I will, and this week I've been posting uh, pictures of Kruger since it's its birthday and I'll definitely have to dig out some of my old Kruger leopard pics but I spent two years living inside the Kruger in a private concession at Singita La Bombo so I think one of my favorite memories of Kruger is going in search of the spotted killifish. Now killifish is a weird pretty little fish and what I recommend is a Get on Google and type in killifish or spotted killifish. It's K I L I, or is it could be a double I, I'm not sure. Killifish. Now, they are quite threatened, and they're threatened because of the aquarium industry. So, they have a very specific habitat requirement, and they often stay in water for very short periods of time, and their eggs can lay dormant for years and years. And there's a section of sand felt that comes in from Mozambique called the Pumbe Sandfelt. Very good for sable antelope as well. And there's a, a pan in, in Kruger, and there's very little of that sandfelt in Kruger itself. 
uh, called Pumbe Pan and uh, we got special permission from uh, the section water of the area we, we lived in, in Kruger and myself and another ranger at the time, Jared. Oh, there we go. Now we've got male leopard tracks. Again, and these look better than the female leopard tracks. And again, on top of my tracks from last night, again, it's a, let me try show you one. It's a bit difficult. Okay, Dave, you got them there. And in the well, right there. Well, if it isn't all the guys and girls from my local Indian... There we go, there they are. So, I said, it's sometimes a bit difficult to show you guys tracks. That's why bushwalk's so great, because you can get above them. From this angle, it's a bit difficult, but okay, let's continue on. Um, I'm definitely going to stick on these leopard tracks. So, as I was saying about the Pumbe sand fault, so we actually took a mosquito net, and we didn't have any nets, and we walked through the pan and dragged the pan and actually found spotted killifish. And it was uh, quite fun. We actually slept in the car. There's an old trading post from uh, the days before Kruger, this old dilapidated building, made a fire, cooked lunch there. I think that's one of my favorite memories of Kruger from a, a long time ago. And then, yeah, as I said recently, uh, when Jamie's birthday went right up to the north of Kruger. She'd never been up there before. And uh, we spent some time in the Porphyry area, which is absolutely exquisite. The biodiversity of trees and birds is incredible. Now, where did that leopard go? Oh, there he is, he's still there. I'm still waiting to find a leopard in this tree here. It's a long-tailed cassia. And uh, now, not so much in this area because we've got a lot of marulas, but in the open plains of the eastern Kruger on the basalt soils where you don't get too many marulas. Uh, these these uh, cassias are one of a leopard's favorite trees to hoist kills in. And also during the winter, particularly because it's an evergreen, they manage to keep a bit of shade. So, James Richards asking a question about endemic plant species uh, to Kruger. Now, most of the major species are not completely endemic to Kruger, but uh, where the Sotpansberg Mountains come in in Pafuri, that mountain range has a thousand different endemic euphorbias. Now, euphorbias are a little succulent, um, and I've lost the leopard tracks. So, I don't know, maybe we listen, maybe we'll get an alarm call. So there's about a thousand different endemic euphorbias to the Sotpans back and some of those are endemic to the region in Kruger. So that's probably the only endemics. The rest of the trees are pretty well spread through the low felt. Uh, there are tree species that are endemic to certain parts, but not endemic to Kruger itself. They still occur in Mozambique and Zimbabwe and other places uh, in in, in, in Africa. But one of the more interesting ones, it's also in the Sotpansberg, there's are, there are a few spread out through the Kruger and even one in the Sabi Sands is the Zanzibar fig. And obviously we are a very long way from Zanzibar. And uh, what, what happened is that the figs were eaten by the Arab traders that used to trade through the, from the, I think about the 14th century through the eastern part of, of Africa. And uh, there's two tree species that are, have, have spread on the main trading routes. Uh, the fig less so, but there are a few of them around, uh, all along the main rivers, because the rivers are obviously lifeblood. So as they traded, they'd move up and down the rivers. Now there's the tamarind tree, which is of course originally native uh, to India and the east. Now tamarinds are locally native. They've probably been in Africa for probably a thousand years now. Uh, specifically more in East Africa, where the, uh, the Arab trading ports of Gedez and Kilwa were on the east coast. But uh, on the Zambezi Valley, the Limpopo Valley, you do find tamarind trees and Zanzibar figs that are left over from human trading routes. So really fascinating. And up on that, the Pafuri area on the Limpopo River there, there are a few tamarind trees and Zanzibar figs. There's actually a Zanzibar fig probably about 15 kilometers from us 
as the crow flies due to the south on the Sand River. It took us a long time to figure out what it was because it's not a tree you normally find in these parts. So I've just lost these leopard tracks now. I'm not sure whether he's ducked off into the bush here. Let's have a quick look a bit further back. A little two track road that goes off there. I'm just wondering if he took a wonder down there. And he stopped walking in a nice soft spot. So we're looking at looking for these leopard tracks at the moment. All I see is hyena tracks. Let's just go back a little bit more. And while I've got my head bent over the side here, Joshua has asked a very interesting question. Hi Joshua. I'm trying to find you a leopard at the moment. Um, about leopard hierarchy and when new leopards move in and out of an area. So let me just try to find this last track. So with female leopards, it works slightly different from males. Now, I think I'm trying to think of the correct word to use here. Joshua, female leopard, oh, nearly drove over it. I think it was the leopard. I think he might have ducked the other way. Um, female leopard territories are dynasterial. It's probably the best description of them. So there are dynasties. So they are passed from female to female generally. I mean, there's always exceptions to every rule. Right, that's a hyena. Well, let's, I want to come back here later. I think I'm just going to check towards the water uh, on, a, on a whim, see if that works better. Um, so Joshua, so what happens when a female leopard gives birth to a female cub? It, she generally, once that cub reaches uh, maturity, and they reach maturity and independence a lot younger than males do. So they normally hit that at about just over a year. She will sort of move out of the core area of her, of her territory where that cub has grown up. And uh, she will then move to the peripheries and challenge or push the other leopards. Obviously she's older, she's got experience in fighting, and she'll push and move the, the next female along. I think that is happening at the moment with uh, Salahesh, and she's pushing into, into Shadow's territory. But because Quatile has died, uh, it seems like Shadow is spending more time in Quatile's territory. So very interesting little leopard dynamics happening there in the western sectors. But with male leopards, so generally from about, they'll often hang around with mom till they're about two, even sometimes two and a half. From then they're pushed generally by the dominant male in the area and then they all meander. Uh, in the Sabi Sands, Greater Kruger area, they don't meander as far as other places. It all depends on densities. So uh, anything from 10 to 600 kilometers, <laughs> believe it or not, has been recorded. And what that does is it moves them out of their mother's natal range and also out of that sort of dynasterial home range of that lineage of female leopards, ensuring that they spread that lineage's genes into different groups of leopards. So it is, it is very fascinating. Now in terms of what actually happens, now male leopards will, will, and female leopards will fight. And in my experience, the females seem far quicker to fight. The males do a lot of posturing, like lying opposite each other, sawing, scent marking, snarling. But uh, the, the leopard fights I've seen, I've seen far more female leopard fights and, and, and far more aggressive. In I actually saw a female leopard, a very big female leopard, down along the Sand River, stalk and jump onto a new young female that had come in and whack her so hard that she burst uh, not only her eyeball but her blood vessel. And that was the, the last time I ever saw that female leopard. Whether she survived or not, I never knew. Uh, if you guys remind me, I'll try to show you a picture. I've got a photograph of this leopard with a completely red eye. So 
blood completely filling the eye and swollen. And, but they will fight and fight very viciously for territory if need be. So I'm hoping that maybe that male leopard took a shortcut through this block and heading down towards the waterhole. We're, we're about a minute away from the waterhole, so we're just going to have a quick look what's there. And then if I get no luck here, I'll head back towards last tracks and try to decipher what's going on there. And here we go, we're about to appear onto the open area around the Cheetah Plains pan. No luck with the tracks yet. Now, do you see some movement in the distance? It looks like zebra to me. I'll show you now. It's going to be quite difficult. The light is quite difficult. We're looking straight east. So, nothing at the water itself. But if we go right down there, a little bit to the left, Dave. There we go. Uh, there we go. Some zebra in the distance there. But while we continue to check around the Cheetah Plains area, Jamie's got an interesting bird to show you. I'm trying to play a game with this red crested Corhan. Not really so much a game, it's just try and sneak up a little bit closer on it. It keeps running behind the various bushes out here. It's the same male that we saw yesterday, or at least I strongly suspect it is. This is his territory, and we've got a beautiful view of his red, oh, his red belly, <laughs> his black belly, which extends all the way up to his sternum, and then that grey cap on the top of his head that tells us it is a male, first of all, and then second of all, that it's hiding a ring of bright red feathers that sits underneath there and gives the red-crested Corhan its name. Uh, I've only seen that red crest a couple of times. They only really display it when it is mating season and when they're competing with another male. And that is by far not the most extravagant part of their display. They are most famous for their upward flight and then pulling in their wings and tumbling out of the sky only to open their wings right at the last minute to stop that downward spiral. It's what gives them another name, the suicide bird. And the further up they fly and the longer they hold off on opening their wings, the more attractive the lady red-crested corhans find them. Because <laughs> apparently there's nothing like a, a show of silliness to inspire faith in a mating partner. Oh, you took offense at that, all puffed up. That's actually just because it's still relatively cold. All of the birds at the moment are trying to trap the warmth in their feathers. Our red crested Corhan has got an interesting combination of the striking black belly and then those really almost Franklin like feathers on the tops of their bodies. Great way of camouflaging themselves and if they can they will lie down on the ground if they're far enough away from a predator that they can escape. They'll lie down on the ground and just remain completely still at which point they're almost impossible to see. And we're so lucky because this I think is the closest we've come to this red-crested Gohan. He's slowly getting more and more used to us in the vehicle. opportunity to just sunbathe a little bit. So the Corhans and the Bustards are all a part of the same family. The largest member, the Cory Bustard, something Brent was discussing yesterday, the Cory Bustard is the heaviest flying bird at close up between sort of 14 to 17 kilograms, up to 30 to 35 pounds of bird, exceptionally large. We do get them here, but we hardly ever see them in this area, in this habitat. Oh, I wonder if he wasn't stalking something there. Combination 
very versatile eaters, so they'll be insect feeders as well as picking up grass seeds and whatever other seeds they can find. Beak is relatively multi-purpose. The other member of the busted family or the Kohard family that we see regularly is the black-bellied bustard. Much, much larger than the red-crested Kohard. Look at that. Doesn't he look like he's got a very full crop? Look around the base of his neck and see that slight swelling in that storage space that birds utilize, the crop that they can eat and digest at will. It's also all part of their comp slightly more complex digestive system. Since they don't have teeth that they can chew their food with, they have to masticate or crush up the food in a different kind of way. And they do that through having relatively muscular stomachs that can crush the food that's in it, along with swallowing a couple of bits of pebbles and various rocks and stones to help them digest. All right, I think I'm going to leave him be. He's the most relaxed he's been around the vehicle since we first started seeing him, so that's a nice thought. And as soon as I can get Wendy into reverse, we shall move off. There we go. <laughs> Wendy's decided that I've reversed enough today. No more reversing for us. The hyenas never made a reappearance. I wonder where they disappeared off to. Somewhere not too far away from here, in fact just around this corner, on the subject of birds and their incredible adaptions to flight and various other things, Nature is Beautiful would like to know a little bit more about the enormous feather that we found yesterday. Now, to, for those of you who missed it, it was a feather about this long. Oops. Let's try and drive on the road at the same time. A feather, <laughs> a feather well over a foot long and about that wide. Definitely <laughs> shouldn't be taking my hands off my steering wheel at this, on this road. A uh, very large feather, very dark in colour. And nature is beautiful. You were wondering if I still think that it is a vulture feather. And if so, if I could give a rough idea as to which one that it might have been. It's a really difficult one. It's, it's got no coloration to it. It's got no differences in color. It's got no indicator as to what it might be. It's just a kind of uniform dark brown color, dark brown, almost gray color. And the difficulty lies, of course, in that it is a primary feather. It's a primary flight feather of some description, but I couldn't begin to tell you which species it's from. It could, that size could be anything from a, a leopard-faced vulture right to a hooded vulture. Hooded vultures, even though they're the smallest of the vulture family, they're still a relatively large bird. They're quite large and quite powerful, and their flight feathers are relatively broad. Unfortunately, nature is beautiful. It would be pure guesswork on my part. If we had to go statistically by numbers, well, then we would say that it is a, a white-backed vulture because that's the, the most common vulture that we see out here. That or the hooded vulture would probably be my guess. It might even have been another bird of prey, maybe a large brown snake eagle for example, or maybe even a martial eagle. It's just, I don't know enough about feathers to be able to tell you where exactly that feather came from. Let's double check what's sitting on top of that termite mound. You never know. We've seen clip springers before. It's unlikely. No, its back's not hunched enough. I'm looking. There's a little termite mound. There we go. Is that even anything? Is that an antelope of some description? Let me just double check. No, that's a mound of dirt. 
Looks like one. Can't, I can see a sideways facing head, but apparently not. It's because Brent put that picture up of a Sharps face book this morning, making me want to find one of the more unusual of the little antelope. Well, one thing about that feather that I did do was I absolutely came home, straight home, and washed my hands immediately after touching it. And that's because I do think that it might be a vulture feather. Vultures, as you know, are not exactly known for their hygiene. Although they do go and they do wash themselves in rivers after feeding on a kill, to be honest, the thought of of where that vulture might have been and what might be on that feather sort of put me off a little bit in terms of touching it so I did go and wash my hands straight away there are certain germs out here that one really doesn't want to be exposed to and in this dry season in particular vultures can be one of the main spreaders of anthrax if they feed off a carcass that has being killed due to anthrax. What they often do, because as I said, they're not the most hygienic of things, but they do often go and bathe in rivers and water holes after they've fed off a carcass. And what they'll do is they'll go and they'll actually transfer the anthrax spores into a river or a, a dam. It's very unusual, of course, to have an anthrax outbreak or it used to be in the last few years but as it starts to get more and more dry we're going to I would say we're going to start seeing more cases of anthrax it's a naturally occurring disease it's a naturally occurring bacteria out here in its own way it's a very clever bacteria in the way in which it operates the fact that those spores can stay inactive and yet still come back to life after decades worth of sort of torpor underneath the soil completely inactive for days and days at a time is something that I find incredible yet also slightly scary interesting track here for you if I can just find a good example again there's a honey badger track unfortunately I only saw it at the last moment as my wheel went over it it seems to have gone off the road but I'll keep looking for it and on the subject of things that are likely or unlikely during this drought Hi, good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You wanted to know whether I think it will be more likely that we'll see a brown hyena this year due to the lack of rain. I'm just thinking about it. I don't think so, no. I think that it will remain equally likely at any time of year. The thing is, for a brown hyena, brown hyenas <laughs> thrive in desert situations, in arid situations. They're much more common up towards the Kalahari, towards the Namibian side of southern Africa, Botswana. You're far more likely to see them around those sorts of areas. And that is because they are even better than their spotted hyena cousins, which aren't too bad themselves, at coping with drought situations. So it remains a fact that this particular area is not ideal habitat for a brown hyena. They like those rocky creviced areas. They like to build their den sites there. And they also prefer not to be around a high density of lions and spotted hyenas. Because they're outcompeted by both of those animals. Now, unfortunately, Kyle, I don't think that that particular animal, or I don't think that the drought will increase our chances of seeing that particular animal. However, there are other animals that we would, that there is an increased chance of seeing. Something, for example, like a sable, which we've touched on before. And the possibility that with limited water access points and limited access to food, the sable might decide to start moving back in our direction. And of course, the first sable in 17 years was seen on the Juma Dam camera not too long ago. 
That being said, Kyle, it doesn't necessarily mean that we won't ever see a brown hyena. They have been seen once before. Now, it could always happen. You might get a nomadic individual searching for a territory or searching for mating opportunities. That's awfully inconvenient. We must have just missed them. I've been tracking them the whole time. There's a herd of elephants in this block. But they are not very easy to spot, despite being absolutely enormous. At the moment, the only view I can get is, I think, that one, which is not very good. Let me try going back a little bit. Maybe that will work. She's not even moving towards us. There she goes. And something's upset this elephant herd because while I've been checking around in Parlor Plains, oh, she's got a tiny, weeny little baby. It's impossible for you to see, though, unfortunately, right in the thick vegetation. But something has upset them. I think probably the presence of those big bulls pushing behind them. But they've been exceptionally vocal. And as Brent described in his video that he posted on Facebook, generally what upsets elephants is other elephants. I'm going to cruise slowly just to see that we, if we can get a view. Otherwise, I think we'll leave our elephants and continue our search for other things. And Jeffrey, you were wondering on the subject of elephants, will elephants ever consume their dung? in order to get nutrients? And the answer is, the adults generally not. What they might do is sometimes put another elephant's dung close to their mouth, and that's not that they're eating it. It's that they are getting the scent of that dung closer towards them. However, little baby elephants and little zebra, both species that are high in gut fermenters, will eat the dung of their mothers occasionally. And that's to transfer the antibodies that they need so they don't just get it from her milk they will also get it from eating her dung through coprophagy as well as getting enzymes apparently although I struggle to see how on earth an enzyme this is something I've read that apparently they get enzymes through their mother's dung I cannot work out how an enzyme which is a protein that denatures at the drop of a hat how on earth they get enzymes and ingest them and that it survives their stomach acid. But that's apparently one of the theories is that they get enzymes as well. I struggle with that a little bit. And a lovely bachelor herd of impala. As you can see, something has attracted their attention. In this case, unlike this morning when I'm pretty sure they were alarm calling it another impala in the low light or maybe a hyena out of confusion. They've just been looking at the elephants that are moving through. A group of young bachelors, all at different ages, right through from two until almost fully grown, in the case of the one ram, just at that stage where his horns are starting to take their upward curve and almost, almost reaching their full adult shape. They even be about three or so years old. The other reason that I've come along here, apart from the constant quest for good signal areas, is because this is where Karula's tracks last were seen. We haven't worked out where she's gone, as far as I know. And we're going to do a good check around Treehouse Dam and those sorts of areas, since we know that she likes it there. She doesn't seem to have crossed out. However, she, from what I can see in terms of the tracks, she would have spent her night dodging hyena. I don't know what occurred in the hyena world last night, but something got them interested and excited about racing around and sniffing all of the different areas. Don't know if it was a, a strange hyena entering their territory, perhaps, or that theory that there was a hyena skirmish last night I think is also a very good one.
Your tracks are just crisscrossing all the way through. Well, we head to the southern boundary of Juma. Let's travel all the way to the southeast, right up to the Kruger National Park boundary on its fantastic 90th birthday and find out what Brent is doing on Cheetah Plains. So I've just gone through for a big walk following those male leopard tracks. He's actually changed direction. He's now heading north. So we're checking the next road along. The last track I had was actually very close to our Cheetah Plains repeater. So that's the mast that sends, well our vehicle sends I think a signal to there that sends it to Gary, that sends it to Final Control, that then spreads it through the world. So, and Sorry guys, just need to. The stations have been down for at 15, any updates in the east? Sorry guys, just need to check in. Ah, sounds like nothing further. Gonzova Wanunengwe heads off central towards Owl's Nest in the block, following up. Okay, back with you now. Sorry guys, I'll be back with you in a second, I just need to listen to that. Sounds like there could be a male line somewhere heading towards us. I'm trying to hear yeah, them. Comes a little bit. Oh no, sorry. It's not not around here. Further to the west of us. Turn that down now. Okay, so we're looking for that male leopard. His tracks came through here. So don't have any tracks of him yet. It's possible that he's maybe got a kill or something inside this block. It's quite a big block, quite a thick block. So while I, I'm not only looking at the ground for tracks, I'm also checking any prominent tree in case he might have some meat in it. Oh, look at there. Now also, Leopards love big termite mounds. They often land, not land, I'm sorry, a bird flew past, so I said land, um, but they'll sit on top of these termite mounds and, and check what's going on around them. It's always good to just double check. They like to lie low on top of them, so their head actually just looks like a column from the termite mound. And if any unsuspecting impala or dica or stanbok happens to wander nearby, it becomes a dinner. Okay, so it's not only about the lions and leopards, of course, there are lots of different creatures for us to show you out here. And uh, it's, it's not something you see too often, a flock of birds, but they just keep keeping ahead of us. I'm just going to try to stop a little bit further away. Just find David Gap through the trees. I think it's coming up now. There we go. So, in the top of that marula tree, normally, oh, there goes one, there's still another. Um, to the left, and zoom a little bit higher. There we go. There's some African hoopoos. Now, this is quite a big flock. Normally, you see them individually, but there's, oh, off one goes. There's another still to the right and above. Oh, there's another three or four up there. So, there we go. African hoopoos. Now, you can see that scimitar-shaped bill. Slightly bent, not quite as much as the wood hoopoos or the scimitar bills, but that bill specially designed to sort of get in the crevices between bark uh, to pry out any little worm or insect that might be living underneath the bark. 
Now, because it's been so cold this morning, you'll find quite a lot of the birds will be trying to find a nice tree without too many leaves to sit on and bask until they warm up enough to carry on with their morning's foraging. Oh, went down to one. Down to none. <laughs> Off they go. But so we're going to keep moving. So while we keep scouring this area for that male leopard, let's go see what Jamie's up to back in the northwest. Oh, we've been checking very thoroughly for Karula's tracks. We've just been chatting a little bit about the changes in the Kruger National Park for the time that Viam and myself have been old enough to remember it and to experience it. And the new arrival, oh goodness, the elephants have been very busy here. The new arrival of a series of chains, chain restaurants at the various rest camps and we're trying to discuss whether or not it is a good thing or a bad thing. It's everywhere sort of in the southern and the central section that has it. And we've decided that we quite enjoy it and although the rustic and rural theme was very pleasant in its day, it is very nice to get hold of exceptionally good food and very friendly service. And then, of course, in our, in our lifetime, we've seen Kruger go through several enormous floods. And there's some terrifying videos of what those rushing waters look like. In times of excessive rain, when the waters come flooding down the Sabi and the Sand and the Crocodile Rivers, the Olifants River. And as you drive along today, you can go and have a look at all of the, the river lines. They've painted yellow lines where the water line made its way up the road. Just to give you a rough idea of just how incredibly tremendous the power of nature can be. And people being, I remember vividly watching news stories on people being airlifted out of their camps and rescued and cars being washed away. I was in the 2012 flood. Were you there? Oh, no. You were there in the 2012 flood. Did you have to be rescued? No, but we couldn't leave. Ah. So VM got stranded in the 2012 floods and had to be, had to wait at the Latava rest camp. Quite an interesting aspect. I bet, the, I bet the sort of communal camp spirit was quite entertaining whilst everybody was trapped and isolated there, hoping the floodwaters don't creep any higher. Not so long ago, I went on holiday and went to go stay at a friend's house just outside Hoodsprayt. I was due back at work and I couldn't get there, thanks to the floodwaters. Just every chance that my car would have been washed away if I'd tried to cross one of the little rivers. Hard to imagine now. It's, everything is so different. Aaron, apparently you were answering a question, or Brent answered your question about what your favorite, or what his favorite memory is of Kruger, and you were wondering what mine might be. There's a cookie there. Sorry. Aaron, we will be there in one second. It's a cookie we don't often see, so we are going to try and look at it, even if our camera doesn't quite compare to the one. He is in the Weeping Wattle VM. If we go a little bit to the right, oh, you got him there. Oh, there we go. And he was being mobbed by starlings. This is always an incredible type of behavior to witness. Let's see which one it is. It looks like a jack, oh, no, it's a levelance or a levelance cuckoo, or previously known as a lesser striped. Don't often get to see cuckoos at least at this time of year, especially because they're quite shy birds and they've all gone very quiet since it's outside of breeding season. That is a lesser striped or levalent cuckoo. Tell the part from the told apart, told is not really a word, told apart from the Jacobin cuckoo, which is very, very similar in terms of size, shape and color but it has more in the way of barring, of sort of 
black stripes on its chest. And the reason it was being chased by starlings, and that's actually why I stopped, I thought that they might continue to try and chase it, was because that is the natural instinct of the various bird species out here. And you'll probably find that the Levalence cuckoo does parasitize starlings in particular. I know that the greater spotted cuckoo also parasitizes starlings. And what the birds do, even though it's not really breeding season at the moment, the cuckoos aren't laying but that instinct still kicks in to defend themselves against the possibility of having to raise another bird's chick. And cuckoos are an interesting thing. Karen, I haven't forgotten your question. I will come back to it, but since we did see a cuckoo, the war between a cuckoo and the host parasites is something quite phenomenal in terms of the way that it plays out. Uh, there's this constant, it's like an arms race. It's like a competition in evolution to see who can come up with the best avoidance technique. So, for example, the Deirdrix cuckoo can imitate up to 21 different types of eggs. And yet, the host species probably aren't sold. Even though the egg kind of looks like their egg, it will never be exactly right. But it's not necessarily that the birds are fooled but they're too scared to push the cuckoo's egg out of their own nest in fear of retribution from the cuckoos themselves. So almost a mafia-like behavior from them. And then you've got the other little bird species that have very cleverly learned which species parasitizes them because cuckoos are species specific. They'll have one or two species that they will parasitize. But they've learned which cuckoo will come after their nests and look to plant their eggs with them and in retaliation something like a white brown scrub robin for example what they will do is they have what they have learned is to imitate the call of that particular cuckoo and very very loudly now as you know a bird's call a sort of territorial type display can be all that is required to send one male bird flapping off away from a bird that sounds bigger and stronger than he does rather than having to sort of plan their battles or match their battles through physical confrontation. Now the cuckoos get intimidated by the imitation of their call thinking there's another bigger male cuckoo somewhere in the region and off they go. Now there's all kinds of different techniques that the cuckoos utilize. It's so clever. One of the things I find absolutely fascinating. Here you go, Joey, in Australia. This is for you. You wanted to see a kudu, and we have provided in spectacular style. Isn't he just gorgeous? His coat shining in the sun, and those enormous spiraling horns. Again, back to Kruger, since it is Kruger National Park's birthday. Those of you who do go to visit, pay a visit to Skakuza's sort of central area and have a look at the huge statue that they have up in the center there. It's of two kudu engaged and locked in a battle with their horns stuck together. And I, that, to me, is one of my most vivid memories of Kruger is standing looking at that statue as a child and Aaron just to bring us back to my favorite Kruger story I'm still trying to decide which one is my favorite but I have a very early memory of standing at that statue and looking at those kudu and being enthralled by that and I guess I wonder if I ever realized that in many years time I would be witnessing those sorts of battles and in fact in C1 that had a very sad ending too, actually, because sometimes kudu get locked together in a fierce battle and they can't untangle their horns and they either both die or one of them dies because they can't work together to unlock those spiraled horns. It does happen and I have seen it. And I wonder if I realized that, of course I didn't. I would never have known that as a child. Aaron, my favorite Kruger memory 
It is so difficult. I have a really vivid memory of my, it's one of my earliest bush memories, and apparently I must have been about two or three at the time, sitting on the bridge near Skakuza and having a big male lion walk past the window. And I've gone with my grandfather. My grandfather used to be a game warden in this area, so he loved going through to the game reserves when we, he was still a little bit younger. Now that, that memory of this huge male walking right past my window with his big mane and I, rem I, I don't remember what I thought exactly but I have a distinct feeling of the enormity of that animal, of the enormous size of that animal. Now that's one of my favorite Kruger memories just because it's so intrinsically linked to my childhood love of the bush. Another favorite of mine <laughs> was Oh, uh, another another favorite of mine in terms of childhood Kruger memories, it's so hard to pick, but was coming around the corner, racing around the corner, trying to get back to the gate before they closed, and being met with this enormous bull elephant who clearly wanted to come down the road towards us. We had very little space to pull, us, pull to the side to let him come past. And I remember my mom getting distinctly stressed and to the prospect of us being flipped over by an elephant because of course at this stage not entirely sure how to handle the situation so we did a very rapid reverse and my mom showed some impressive almost rally like driving skills in her ability to drive around corners backwards i remember my cousin screaming and my little brother fast asleep in the seat he was about he was a baby then but aaron if i had to tell you my favorite memory it's a little bit corny but I have to say that I think some of the trips that I've done with Brent, especially our recent one, would probably be high up there in my favorite Kruger memories. We went right up to the northern area of Kruger, up to Pafuri, and we're out at the park gate at the opening time. And we drove around, we didn't, we only saw one other person who was an older gentleman who was clearly just there enjoying the bird life. But we drove through, it's beautiful, we hardly saw we didn't really see anything that people would traditionally think of as exciting. But we did have an absolutely amazing time. We saw elant and herds of buffalo streaming out of the Levuvu River forest, those fever tree forests, and it was just a thoroughly pleasant experience. I enjoyed that, and I enjoyed the trip up there as well. Those are probably my favorite Kruger Park memories. We also did a wonderful trip, Brent, myself and Andrew as well, which is very entertaining. No sign of Karula coming out here. I wonder where she disappeared off to last night. While we try and figure that out, let's head back across to Brent for an update on Cheetah Plains. So, those leopard tracks went into a very thick block, so we decided to just do a quick check along the open areas for the possibility of cheetah. But what we have found is not a cheetah, but some giraffe in the distance. Uh, quite a big group, it looks like I can see four at the moment. But it always pays to peruse the plains. And here we go. So unfortunately those giraffe are quite far below our southern boundary, but fortunately we have a camera with some fantastic zoom. Now, well, you have a look at those giraffes. It always pays for me to pick up my binoculars and check around for any other beasties that could be here. Now, often the cheetah will lie so flat to the ground you can barely see them. So far, no cheetah. Just uh, some giraffe and then some wildebeest and zebra in the distance as well. So it looks like Gnorman, who wasn't here yesterday, has uh, got some girlfriends off to the southwest of us. So there we go. They're quite far away, but there we go. Yeah, wildebeest and zebra.
Oh, okay, I just heard something. I'm just going to take my ears out for a second. I just need to listen. Could we be that lucky? I thought I heard a wild dog contact call. Ooh, 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 ooh. Coming from around the Kruger boundary. Just once. Well, let's leave these long distance zebra, wildebeest, and giraffe, and let's head east towards the Kruger boundary. And uh, we can also wish Kruger a happy birthday in person. But even that, as we head to the east, that, it was very difficult because the game drive radio was going in my ear when I heard it, but 60% mm, sure I heard a wild dog contact call, a, a woo call. So it's when the pack hunts, they get split up and the call they give is, sounds like a woo. Not a woo girl, I think that's a different thing that you find in the big cities, not so much out here in the African bush. Uh, I've seen a movie with woo girls where they go woo at everything. The wild dog woo is a little bit more pleasant on the ears. It's, uh, it sounds more or less like this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. As opposed to the final control who goes, woo! <laughs> now, even though we're heading there, it's always worth double checking in any little bit of shade out in these open areas for those male cheetahs. They haven't been seen in a while. Ooh. Gabar Goshawk. Did he land? He's gonna land. Oh, and he's being attacked by the fork-tailed drongos. There we go. Little Gabar Goshawk, one of the Sipters. Now, these are incredible predatory birds that hunt other birds. And he's managed to get himself a little bit of safety. And the fork-tailed drongos, as soon as he moves out of that thicket, will attack him. Oop, there he goes. An incoming fork-tailed drongo. Oh, he's very quick. Now, as you can see, he's so fast because he is a bird hunter. Well, he is flying in the direction we're going, so maybe we'll get lucky enough to have a better view of him. So for our birders out there, there's a few little gray goshawks and sparrowhawks that look quite similar. But when they're flying, the gabar goshawk has a very important diagnostic uh, for you to have a look at. And I will... Oh dear. I've lost all my paraphernalia. I know I had it with me earlier. Very strange indeed. Hmm. What have I done with my iPad? Anyway, well, have a look just now. But uh, what I was saying is that I remember it was cold and misty, so I put it in my box. Uh, what I was saying is that as they fly, they've got a very distinctive white rump. Now, let's look where the, the drongos are attacking, and that might give us a sign. So the drongos are here, but they seem to be swooping. Oh, there he is, being mauled. He's going to land right, yes, there we go. You got him on top of that, there we go, right in the center. There he is. Now there's that little Gabar goshawk. And he's having a hard time of it with the other birds. It's not, oh, off he goes again. He's trying to escape the drongos. The drongos are coming in. But I don't know if you got a flash. Nice work, Dave. Very difficult, that. Um, a flash of that white rump. Now, as I said, it's a diagnostic of the Gabar goshawk as he flies away. Let me just get my into the right spot here quickly. So while we do that, I'm just going to meander a little bit further towards the Kruger boundary so we can have a look down that big boundary road in case we do get a sign of uh, those wild dogs. There were tracks around in Coral earlier today. And we want G, Goshawk. Okay, so I will show you what I was talking about. There 
we go. So we did have a, what sounded to be a contact call of wild dogs. I had the radio in my ear, so I'm not 100% sure, I'm about 60% sure. There's very little else in the bush that sounds like that, that call. Okay, so we're on the Kruger boundary now. Just want to check. We can see quite a long way either direction here. So just having a quick look. And while we do that, let me see, there we go. So that is the Gabar Goshawk. And you do get a minimalistic version, which is a completely black version. I'm just looking for the flying pictures. There we go. So, oh, so you can see there, there's that very distinct white rump as it takes off and flies. And you can't really get it confused with the minimalistic form, which is just below, which is completely black. And it's the only completely black little goshawk we get in this area. So we are sitting on the Kruger National Park boundary. This is Kruger. So let me just pay my respects. There we go. So let's just shake hands. You know it's illegal to cross the boundary, but I'm, I'm not going to cross the boundary. I'm going to shake hands with the variable bush willow to say, Happy birthday, Kruger National Park, 90 years young. Yay! Okay, let's move on. Let's see what else we can find. We've done our obligatory birthday wishes to the, one of the oldest reserves uh, in South Africa. Okay, here's the back end. Let's go see what's been maneuvering between the Kruger and the Sabi Sands. And I didn't break any laws. I didn't put my feet inside. I just touched the branch from outside. So it's always incredibly interesting to move down this area because you never know what could be coming in and we don't know what's on that side. And that's why I always get quite excited coming through here. And of course, there's always a chance that we might find the pangolin again. So just over this ridge is where Dave and I saw that female pangolin. And also we do find the cheetah tracks quite often they use this as a highway up and down. Now, because it's a Kruger's birthday and we happen to be next to Kruger, uh, and if you are wondering about the Kruger National Park, any of its history or interesting stories, you can ask either Jamie or myself about it. And you can do that by sending, me, sending us an email and the email is questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. So, here we go. I would have guessed that wild dog contact call was somewhere in this region, if it indeed was a wild dog contact call. Unfortunately, my gut tells me it was saying happy birthday to Kruger. So, outside of our Travis area. I'm just trying to find some tracks to confirm. Now, we found wild dog tracks on this Kruger boundary quite a few times and we haven't seen them, but I'm very confident that it's a pack we haven't seen before. So, the Sands pack are denning on Ottawa which is uh, to the west of Elephant Plains, part of the Singita Traverse area. And uh, the Investec pack are denning in the Manuleti. And the Manuleti boundary from here is probably seven or eight kilometers. So it's possible that there's a third pack that's coming in from the Kruger and just utilizing a small section of the eastern, northeastern Sabi Sands. Wouldn't it be exciting to see new wild dogs? So it is possible that they crossed back into Kruger beyond our boundary. 
So the tracks were in Coral this morning and I haven't seen any tracks on Cheetah Plains yet. So what we're going to do, actually just one second Dave, just, I'm going to stop on top of this little rise here and I'm just going to zoom down, down the road a little bit to the, zoom again, or down a bit, no it's just a branch, sorry guys, thought I saw something in the shade there. Well Edmund is wondering what is the rarest bird in Kruger? Well, there's a couple of rare residents, but the really rare birds for Kruger are the migrants, or no, sorry, not migrants, the vagrants. So animals or birds that are not normally found within that area that arrive every now and then. And there was one I looked for a lot, but unluckily I didn't find it. I have seen them outside of South Africa. I've seen them in East Africa and it's a very, interesting story because they used to nest um, in Kluge-Amphalosia in Zuland, Namibia and in Kruger and then something changed and they disappeared and every now and then uh, a vagrant just arrives and it's an Egyptian vulture. So there we go, there we, an Egyptian vulture and it's normally an immature one that arrives down here, very lost but as it says, yeah, the status in South Africa, uncertain. Uh, there's a few records in the recent past, possibly an intra-African migrant or Paleoarctic migrant. There's a, used to be, was there, the resident population in South Africa possibly extinct or almost extinct. So it prefers drier, drier habitats, but it is a, a very interesting bird. So it's one of the tool using birds. So if it gets a big leg bone or something like that, it takes stones up into the air and drops them on, on, on ostrich eggs and bones to break them open to get to the marrow. So a fascinating bird and I think the last breeding record yeah, was probably in the mid 80s somewhere. So uh, there was one seen in Kruger last year when, we, when I was in Kruger but unfortunately I wasn't able to get there before it flew away from the road. But on the resident birds and there's a couple that are right on the edge of its of their range and one of the ones that a lot of people go up to that northern part of Kruger where, where Jamie and I went and it's a bird quite a lot of people have not got on their South African list they are far more common further north in Africa and it is one of my favorite birds and it is a roller so it's called a racket tailed roller and there we go, referring to the very distinct rackets on its tail. Now lilac breasted rollers also have rackets, but you notice it doesn't have that lilac breast. Also, it's slightly different in the way it, it behaves. So lilac breasted rollers are very prominent perches. They like to perch out in the open, where there is racket tailed roller, tend to perch in the canopy, making them a bit harder to see. So now if we look at their distribution, <coughs> they only really come in that top northern section of Kruger. And even then, only really in the Pafuri region are they accessible. So, very interesting bird. One of my favorites, very pretty bird. So, they are prefer Miombo woodland. Now, of course, there's lots of different little vagrants and birds that pop in and out of Kruger. And uh, sometimes I'm sure there's lots that are just never get seen because Kruger is that big. Well, we're going to continue now along the boundary hoping that Kruger is going to give us a present for its birthday. Send something across from the wilderness area to our east. So if we get no luck in this area, we're going to start meandering back towards those Styx lionesses and see if they've moved. If they have, I don't think they've moved very far, probably moved into the shade. and. Uh, go see what's happening.
<coughs> so there was very sad news recently. Uh, quite a large pack of wild dogs were, uh, were expired due to canine distemper. And Anna Marie's wondering, weren't they in the Kruger Park? They were, not close to us, fortunately, uh, Anna Marie. Oh, we're causing a traffic jam here. Yeah? Sorry about that. Looks like the Kruger guys. Sorry about that. Hi, Hi how are you guys doing? Uh, we are from, well, we're based at Juma. We're actually streaming live safaris for, uh, on the National Geographic website. So Cheetah Plains is part of our traverse area. Yes. From Cheetah Plains. Yes, as far as I know from what we've heard from the guides, we are allowed to drive on the boundary. I'm sure. Sorry guys, I've just got to do something here quickly. So let's cross back across to the other live game drive um, with Jamie and we'll be back shortly. So you're stuck with us for a little longer, we're just trying to get Jamie ready. Uh, so there we go, we've got normal Norman the Wildebeest and he's on He's Gnormalus Gnorman from the other open area on the Marla Marla Boundaries uh, main competition. So the Wildebeest bulls in this area uh, are defend these little open areas. And at the moment, Normal Norman's not got, got any ladies. All the ladies are with Gnormalus Gnorman on the southern open area. So let's go across to Jamie to see what she's up to. line at the moment between Treehouse Dam and Twin Dams Road. And we're looking here very, very carefully for any tracks of Karula moving down this road. It's usually the route that she takes from Juma down towards, or south, down is not really the correct terminology, but south towards Cheetah Plains. It's a fascinating little ecosystem, a drainage line like this. Lots and lots of Tamburti trees and then also one of my favorite trees, which is the leadwood. What a young one up there. And I say young, it's probably a good few decades old. But they can live well into the 500, 600 years old. Just like those incredible redwood trees that are thousands of years old in North America. We've just been doing some behind the scenes filming and while we've been doing that I've just been thinking about what it is that makes the Kruger National Park so special to us and perhaps why it is that the, we might go through a bit of a signal dip here, I'm just trying to think which beat, the best way for me to go, <laughs> frozen in time, uh, let's, we'll try it, we'll try it, we're going up the hill, it might work out quite well. And I think it's the wonderful thing about the Kruger National Park and what makes it so hard to choose one's favorite memory is that for, for most of us, we've been fortunate enough to travel there throughout our lifetime. So it's kind of been a sort of a, a constant experience that's been shared with different special people in all of our lives. And that is a, perhaps what is or what makes it the most tricky to figure out exactly what our favorite memories really are. Now there's some zebra alarm calling. Yep, 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 yep. Just around to the other side of this road. So let's go find out. We'll see if we can find out what's got them so upset. Ooh. Come on, Wendy, you can do it. Now, for those of you who have been watching for many years, most of the animals here are relatively familiar to you, at least in terms of the mammal species. And Angie wants to know whether or not, or how often, new species are found. And the answer to that, Angie, is there's always new species of insect being found and classified, some that are familiar but are reclassified into different family groups. And I think that that's probably 
the level of exploration that we've hit. I think we know all of our mammal species out here. Some might be in unexpected places at unexpected times, but we are familiar with all of the different animal species that we get here. Or mammal species. Insects, on the other hand, as you know, we've got a sort of a constant scientific exploration throughout the world of the different beetle, insect, arthropod, arachnid species, and they're constantly being reclassified and discovered at the same time. And who knows? For all we know, there might be a mystery frog that is somewhere that's hidden about that we might discover and reclassify. It would be a very exciting time if we do. Yellow-billed hornbill cleaning his bill, but just beautifully lit in this morning light. But half of the attraction, I think, in spending time out here is actually just the constant learning. And Angie, it's less, for us, I think it's less about the new species, since we're familiar with most of them, but more learning different things about the different animals. And the way that these yellow-billed hornbills nest and they're sheltered holes in a tree and a male like this one being completely responsible for keeping his mate fed during her time of confinement in the nest hole. She loses her primary feathers, her flight feathers and she is completely reliant upon his care. And just the general rediscovery of the different ways in which we understand the animals that we surround ourselves with. Wild dogs, for example, I still think that we're learning day by day about the complexities of their packs. And most definitely for me, the, one of the most exciting is learning more about spotted hyenas through observation. And sometimes I just wish that there were more hours in the day to spend following them around and trying to interpret exactly what it is that's happening within their little groups, within their packs. The intricacies, it almost becomes like a, a soap opera in a way, but it's more about figuring out who is who and where each hyena falls in that complex society, and at the same time how it differs from other hyena groups that have been extensively studied in parts of Botswana and then towards Eastern Africa in Tanzania because there have to be differences. It's a completely different ecosystem, it's a completely different set of environmental circumstances that they have adapted to. And for us at Safari Live, new characters as well, new and older characters and watching the way that they interact, so Karula, and now getting to knowing Kanyeni, who is currently on the Torchwood boundary with her two cubs. I have yet to see her. I got very excited the other day because I thought that I had found her, but it turned out to be Tundi, not that that wasn't wonderful as it was. Lovely question coming through from Elizabeth in Santa Monica who still has faith in us finding her cats or at least in this case passing on advice in terms of how to find them. Elizabeth, you wanted to know what advice we would have for newbies in terms of spotting the more elusive cats. And Elizabeth, let's take Kruger for example and doing a little bit of reading or watching Safari Live you'll get to know the patterns of movements of the animals. We know that in the hottest times of day there's a good chance they're going to be sleeping somewhere off in the shade, but especially for lions, but for leopards and for cheetah as well. And then some very good advice is to learn the types of habitats that those cats enjoy. That works especially well for cheetah. Those big open clearings that the Kruger National Park has is a really good place to start. Have a look around there and see if you can't spot them. Have a look at the sightings boards at each of the camps. They'll tell you when last the animals were seen 
and you can head in that direction and try and spot them and get lucky there. And the nice thing about Kruger is that if you're driving some of the main routes, you can almost guarantee that there will be somebody who has spotted the animal for you. Now that might kind of sound like cheating, but it definitely doesn't feel that way when you're sitting back relaxing and enjoying a leopard sighting. If you want to go and find leopards, just speaking from general experience, Letaba and Early Funds Camp, we saw four in two days, in three days. Now that's something that is particularly enjoyable. <laughs> Four leopards in three days is a pretty impressive record in Kruger. And it was different leopards as well. And it is both a blessing and a curse in a way that you know that you will always find somebody who has located the sighting before you, especially in the busier areas of Kruger. Rachel, you were wondering what does Kruger do to teach the self-drivers the rules and how to behave? It's a tricky one because whenever you have a situation like that with lots of different people, you are guaranteed to have rule breakers, people that are going to make life difficult. Watching a grey hornbill with, a, with something in its beak, but unfortunately it flew out of our sight. Rachel, there's always, there is an instruction booklet giving, given to each and every visitor when they enter the park along with a set of rules of how to behave. And for the most part, 90% of the guests behave very well. It's the 10% or maybe even less, maybe it's the 5% that make life more difficult. The people who climb out of their vehicles, particularly in sightings, which astounds me and it shows a a lack of understanding of just how fast an, a wild animal can move and just how dangerous they can be and also most importantly a, a severe lack of respect considering that they're driving around in the elephant's home or the the animal's home and the fact that they feel as though they're entitled to disturb that animal never fails to astound me but it is it comes from a position of ignorance generally more than anything else and unfortunately it's a difficult thing because if, they, if, if the guards at the gate had to go through the rules verbally with each and every person, you'd never get through the gate. And Kruger has hundreds of cars that come through each and every day, in and out, and sometimes staying at the camps. They can't talk every person through the rules, but a responsible driver who's entering Kruger for the first time, who doesn't feel comfortable, would be well advised to just have a chat to the very friendly staff in order to help. All is quiet on the southern end of Juma. Um, I think we're going to expand our search a little further afield while we do. Brent has found you some big buffalo. Got a smallish herd of buffalo on their way down to the water hole here at Cheetah Plains. We're on our way back to the sticks lions but we just saw this herd meandering across the open area look at that isn't that quite impressive as they march straight towards us now, this is a wonderful photographic opportunity so get ready with those fingers for the screenshots and don't forget to share your screenshots with us and you can do that on our Facebook page which is Safari Live or pop it on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live. And that click click is me taking a few pictures of this herd as it approaches. And it's nice in the early morning light, you get that glint off the horns. Uh, 
uh, herds of buffalo generally like to drink twice a day once in the morning and, and again towards sunset uh, coming down for their morning drink as it's got warmer they've probably started moving they lie up during the cold part of the day probably how many you reckon they have 50 to 70 not the biggest herd I can't see too many young calves with this herd. Now, of course, in trying times like we have at the moment, if you're a buffalo with the drought, the young are the first, the young and the old are the first to succumb. And also the first to be eaten by lions. Sally in Oregon says, this is so impressive, I agree with you. And our timing was impeccable to arrive here as they were about to drink. Now, there's a couple of juveniles sort of between a year and a half and two years old, but no little babies. So far, I can't see any that are showing too bad a condition. Now, if we go up a little bit, Dave, to the right slightly. You can see all this impala running. There's also zebra that have arrived behind. Also making their way towards the water hole as it gets a bit warmer. So you could get some interesting screenshots with the zebra if they pop out into the open. There we go. So buffalo and zebra. And impala. Oh, have a look right next to us, Dev. A big boy. One of the dominant bulls from the herd is walking right past us. Well, it looks like the majority have had their drink and are now going to start moving off. So we're going to try and get back to those sticks lions uh, before the end of the safari. So while we do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Oh, while Brent heads back across to the Styx lionesses, it would be wonderful if we finally got to see those cubs it seems as though they're keeping them very far south of our boundary this time around though. Hard to believe that almost, what, what's the date? It's almost the 1st of June, it's the 31st of May. In 10 days time would have been the anniversary of the very first time we saw the Styx Cubs. And the reason I know that so precisely is because that was the day that I came through for my job interview and I was sitting on the back of the vehicle with Brent and Scott was out on tracking team and we got the call through that he had found the Styx Cubs at Twin Dams the first time that they had been, that particular litter had been seen as far as I know. I remember that feeling of absolute excitement and at the same time sheer knee shaking, teeth chattering terror at the thought of taking over the sighting and taking over the drive halfway through. It was a very interesting experience and if I recall correctly, which I'm sure I do, despite the fact that most of that is a blur, 
I stalled the vehicle several times, um, trying to get out of whatever dam Brent had parked. <laughs> yes! And Kirsty's just reminded me of my next moment of crowning glory, which was before I got used to the immobilizers that we had on the vehicle. Now, one button unlocks the vehicle and allows you to start it. One button causes the vehicle to hoot. And unfortunately for me, as I arrived in that sighting, or as I was repositioning in that sighting, I chose the latter and hooted at the lions. Felt absolutely terrible <laughs> in my moment of being incredibly flustered. Hard to believe that a year has passed almost since that particular day. I don't remember anything of the afternoon drive at all. I just remember that the day before, Wendy had flames coming out of the back of her and thus we were down, very much down, to one vehicle. It was before the days that Rusty arrived. So it was just Jigger out. And I remember that sighting, that the Styx female calling her cubs towards them. It was absolutely magical. And hopefully we will see a repeat of that scene in the not too distant future, either with the Styx cubs or with our brand new set of Nkuhuma cubs. And fortunately for those cubs yesterday, the Birmingham boys, from what we can understand and from what, we, what the other guides saw from the tracks on Torchwood, the Birmingham boys, there's no fight between Junior and the Birmingham boys, but it's, it looks as though they did chase him or he did run from their presence. So Junior being the young Nkuhuma male that suddenly made a reappearance with the rest of his pride. And the Birmingham boys did their job and protected their cubs from the intrusion, for them, an intrusion of an unknown male. Or maybe known to them, but certainly not welcome. The sticks and the Nkuhuma pride uh, do share a degree of overlap in their territory, which means that every now and again they come into confrontation with each other. The last time that we know of was a couple of months ago where the Nkuhumas apparently gave the sticks a bit of a beating and sent them packing away around in coral. Dina, you have a really interesting question. If, if two of the prides were to meet, let's say the Styx pride of lionesses and the Nkuhuma pride of lionesses, now of course a, a, the male coalitions, share, they, they have several different prides over which they are dominant. Uh, they look after several different prides, they mate with the females from seven, several different prides. You were wondering if that situation did occur where the two different prides were in conflict, would the males side with one pride over another? The answer is generally not, no. If they happen to be present at that sort of incident, there's a good chance they would nonchalantly sit and watch the comings and goings of the lionesses. They stay above the, the petty squabbles of their various females, if you can put it that way. Unless a lioness were to provoke them in some way, perhaps accidentally back into them, You'd get a lot of snarling, a lot of growling, but chances are for an established coalition like the Birmingham boys, now that they are no longer, now that they're no longer in the process of that pride takeover, chances are they would just sit and watch and not get caught up in the aggression as a way they might have done a year ago when they were younger. If, there's, there's a big difference here though, if one of the females in that pride was in estrus and the male was busy mating with her, you might have a different story. And the reason I say that is because lions, a lion that is courting a female and mating with a female, can, first of all they can be particularly aggressive and second of all they are exceptionally defensive of that female to the point that they will chase members of her pride away from them. So that is where the big difference lies. If a female were mating with a male and another pride entered into the scene, they would immediately choose the side of the female that they were mating with. 